you know what time it is. Football season, Q4. Time to close out another year of growth and prep for the next year of revenue. To bring in more businesses Q4 and beyond, you need HubSpot Sales Hub. With a smart prospecting workspace, deal management suite, and AI-powered apps, you can take total control of your operation to generate more leads and land more sales. And when you pair a sales hub with other hubs in HubSpot Smart CRM, your team will be on the same page across the entire customer journey. Leads won't slip through the cracks, and data is connected across marketing, sales, and operations, so you can better measure your impact on the bottom line. Stop sticking to the same old strategies and start closing more deals, because the best time to score is Q4. Make the switch to HubSpot Sales Hub at HubSpot.com slash sales. Good morning, everyone. It's Friday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, and first round of the NCAA Tournament Day for those who celebrate. I'm Mark Dent, here with Jacob Cohen and Juliet bennett Ryla, and you're listening to The Hustle Daily Show. Today, we're talking about the AI gold rush and Ryan Reynolds, whose phone company was just acquired by T-Mobile and who might actually be good at business. But first, let's talk about everything else that's happening in the world of business and tech. First off, things are getting even dicier for TikTok. The UK has banned TikTok on government-owned devices and the U.S. government has reportedly demanded the app's Chinese owners sell their stakes or risk a general U.S. TikTok ban. This comes about a week after a bipartisan group of lawmakers introduced the bill that would strengthen the president's power to ban an app like TikTok. So it's seeming to be a little bit more of a legitimate warning at this point. Speaking of things coming to an end, rest in peace to Google Glass. We truly hardly knew you. Ten years ago, Google started selling the AR product for $1,500, and basically nobody was interested because it was unclear exactly what Google Glass accomplished, and it looked pretty absurd. A slightly less expensive version of Google Glass had a second wind in the last few years as a product for the healthcare industry. Now, Google is working on a new smart eyewear product, battling rivals Microsoft and Meta. Meanwhile, Stripe's valuation is on the move, and not in the good direction. The digital payments processor's value peaked at $95 billion two years ago. In its latest raise, that value fell to $50 billion. I would not want to lose any type of money that comes close to $45 billion. (laughs) A few more numbers for you. After a surprisingly hopping January, U.S. retail spending cooled. It was down 0.4% in February. Grocery stores and online shopping were still up just slightly, But spending at restaurants and bars fell 2.2%. Department store spending was down 4%. And finally, your savings account will not be excited if you decide to see Drake in concert this summer. Tickets are expected to cost at least $400. Now, maybe the only positive side of this is if you are trying to go, the demand will be much lower than what we've seen for Taylor Swift and Beyonce over the last few months. Beyonce's tickets were as low as $62 at face value. So we're talking about quite the difference between her and Drizzy. All right, let's move on to the main stories now. We're going to be talking about two of them today. And uh, first, we're going to talk about AI. So far this year, venture capital firms have plunged $3.6 billion into 269 AI companies. How are there that many already? I have no idea. (laughs) But several of them are already unicorns. Uh, Jacob, can you give us a rundown of what's been happening and which companies have capitalized the most so far? Yeah, so I think the best way to describe what's going on the last year or so has just been an absolute AI gold rush. You know, I, I wanted to do some kind of fun play on words with March Madness I'm starting to get confused if it's bets for basketball tournaments or bets on AI companies because it's really, really a frenzy out there. Just in the past month, we've seen companies like Cohere reportedly be in talks to raise funding at a $6 billion valuation. Wow. Stability AI in talks to raise at a $4 billion valuation. These sound like the names of gyms, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I feel like that's what these companies are striving for. Cohere, yeah, it's good. Last week, Anthropic, this was after raising $400 million from Google and notching a $4.1 billion valuation, they raised another $300 million. This week, this company, Adept, raised 
$350 million at a $1 billion valuation. So we're seeing really some very large valuations for some very young companies in a pretty young space. Right. And it's interesting. It's it's come at a time when VCs have been a little bit more cautious with their spending elsewhere, I would say, in the tech world. And in the past, of course, also with VCs, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when social media was a big deal, and that's kind of where all the money was getting poured into, there was also like a lot of money being spread around. But then eventually, there was just the domination of a few big tech companies. Are we going to see that here where some of these big tech companies just gobble up the smaller fish, even though they're getting a lot of money right now? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. And, and there really are a lot of smaller fish. I was reading at least 50 of the companies being incubated at Y Combinator right now are apparently focused on this space. And these venture capital firms are really just pouring money on this space wherever they see yeah. a, a potential opportunity. One company, Mobius AI, apparently just a week after launching, barely with an idea, saw a $100 million valuation. I saw this great story about a $58 million house in San Francisco where people are just living there, building these companies. It's called the AGI house. <laughs> <laughs> so similar to a TikTok house. Similar to a TikTok house, but for artificial general intelligence. And to answer your question, yeah, I think the vast, vast majority of these companies like in many different areas of tech, will struggle to outgun big tech and its armies of engineers, uh, its distribution capabilities. Just one instance I thought was interesting. Uh, I think it was last month I was reading about this company, Tome, mm -hmm. which raised $43 million for a pretty cool product, which is basically an AI-powered presentation maker, kind of like ChatGPT, but for making presentations. Very cool. So you can kind of tell it what you want to make and it'll make it for you. Just this week, both Google and Microsoft announced uh, pretty similar competing products. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And the New York Times spoke with a venture capitalist from Slow Ventures, mm -hmm. Sam Lesson, and he told them that he thinks just the absolute vast majority of the spoils in this space are going to be going to the incumbents. And that if you want to invest in this space, the best way to do it is it by investing in the incumbents. So in other words, it might be best for these VCs to just kind of place their bets, place their money <laughs> in Microsoft or something like that, instead of trying to fund some new company that will get good at presentations or whatever. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot, a lot of throwing, you know, what's the phrase throwing spaghetti at the wall, seeing what sticks. It's almost like you're throwing risotto at the wall, seeing what sticks, but there's already yes. a bunch of big the spaghetti strands stuff. there. Yeah. yeah, there's already a bunch of big spaghetti strands there that are blocking all the risotto from sticking anyway. That's a crazy analogy, but I think it works. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I like it because it sounds crazy. Everything that is happening with AI is truly wild and we have no idea where any of it's going to go. Exactly. But one thing that we do know, one guarantee that we do have in life as we move on here, you know, is that Ryan Reynolds has been a you know pretty decent actor for, <laughs> you know, for the last 20 years. Van Wilder, two guys and a girl. <laughs> we saw him in Deadpool. So he, he's been known for quite a while. But apparently one thing we didn't know about him is that he's actually a really good businessman. Juliet, can you tell us what has been happening with Ryan Reynolds and his business ventures? So Ryan Reynolds has been acquiring stakes in various companies and also a Welsh football club. And it seems like everywhere he goes and everything he touches, I would say his effusive personality and the fact that people just like him kind of turns these businesses around and turns them into very valuable companies that get scooped up by other companies. Right, right. And so this week was kind of, I think, where everyone realized, oh, wow, like, you know, Ryan Reynolds is legit. <laughs> yeah. And that was because his company, which he has a 25% stake in at least, Mint Mobile was sold. What happened there, Juliet? So Mint Mobile is a prepaid phone plan company that is advertised to me relentlessly via podcasts, which Ryan Reynolds <laughs> is in the ads. And it already uses T-Mobile's wireless network. So T-Mobile decided that they were going to buy it. Uh, the deal is $1.35 billion, so not a small deal. And then I saw a tweet in which the CEO of T-Mobile, Mike Sievert, is talking about the acquisition. And, you know, of course, Ryan Reynolds shows up because why wouldn't he? Yeah. But one thing Sievert was saying is that they will benefit from Mint's marketing formula. And that marketing formula is basically Ryan Reynolds. Like I said, I've heard him in podcast ads. He does all the ads and he kind of brings that charm that you would expect from Ryan Reynolds to his marketing 
he's funny. He's, you know, making jokes. You know, you just always know that he's got this bit going on. And you see that, I think, in Ryan Reynolds personal life. Like I was trying to think, I think we were all talking earlier. What has Ryan Reynolds been in that we really liked? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. Like, um, I will say definitely maybe is probably my favorite um, (laughs) Ryan Reynolds movie, the rom-com with with Rachel Weisz. But truly, I do sort of struggle to think, but I do like Ryan Reynolds, right? That's the thing, right? Yeah. Well, (laughs) you know, I have this interesting conversation, an ongoing conversation with some friends about Ryan Reynolds, where we are never sure if Ryan Reynolds is being Ryan Reynolds, the actor, or Ryan Reynolds, the person. Right. Because it always feels like no matter Mm -hmm. what context, he's acting like Ryan Reynolds the actor in Deadpool or the Mint Mobile spokesperson. So right. it's uh, it's an interesting trait of his, but I guess works well in a business context. <laughs> right. It's like he's always doing a bit. I think one of the things I am more aware of people talking about than even any of the movies with the exception of perhaps Deadpool is that he and his wife, Blake Lively, are like always trolling each other on social media. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what people like about him. He's just yeah. constantly doing a bit and being really funny, but also like in a likable way. Yeah, so Julia, this isn't Ryan Reynolds' first really big business foray or or huge success. It is definitely the biggest, but he had his own production studio Mm -hmm. uh, that he co-founded, and he's had some involvement in a gin company, right? Yeah, so he also got a stake in Aviation Gin, which is based out of Portland, Oregon, and he did kind of the same thing there, where it was his funny marketing stuff that kind of propelled this company to success. And I remember this vividly. I'm sure you do as well. Peloton came out with like a horrible commercial oh, yes. where this husband had given his wife a Peloton and it felt like she had, I don't know, become tethered to it in like a Black Mirror episode. <laughs> like it was just, you know, it got a lot of backlash. And then immediately Aviation Gin came out with this commercial with the same actress where she's downing a gin martini and she's clearly seen some shit. Genius. And that commercial went viral and then it sort of propelled like now all of a sudden everyone's talking about aviation gin. And ultimately in 2020, a different liquor company, Diageo, acquired it with a handful of other brands for $610 million. And Ryan Reynolds is still involved in the company. I thought this was great. He opened a distillery in Portland that you can go visit and it ends in like what's supposed to be his office, but it's also an escape room (laughs) that you have to solve your way out of. And it's just like... I just love this sort of like everything's always kind of a bit that he brings to these companies. Yeah. And then, of course, like the ultimate kind of Ryan Reynolds business venture, the one that probably everybody thinks of even more than these ones where he's he's been in ads is the fact that he, along with Rob McElhenney, another actor, Mm -hmm. took over Wrexham AFC, a fifth tier Welsh football club. And for our readers who aren't as familiar with sports, particularly those in Europe, that means that they're in like basically the lowest rung (laughs) of the kind of UK soccer divisions where you have um, four leagues ahead of them and the teams can kind of advance when they have really good seasons. And if they have really bad seasons, then they fall back into a lower division. And, And Wrexham has been a doormat forever. But they've gotten really good. Like I was actually just looking at the standings and they're in first place in their division, in that fifth division, meaning they're more than likely going to move up to another division. And Mm -hmm. again, Ryan Reynolds, he's doing it in (laughs) soccer. It's like uh, his Ted Lasso yeah. play or something like that. Exactly. It's like Ted Lasso yeah. <laughs> in real life. And there are social media. It's booming. They're getting sponsorship deals. Ticket sales have tripled. I mean, just everything is going great for this team all of a sudden. Wow. Yeah. And he is also, Juliet, as you have noted in your story, uh, looking to potentially get a piece of the Ottawa Senators who have, mm-hmm. have kind of been uh, generally a uh, not so great hockey team, but with a decent um, history. So uh, he could mm-hmm. continue to do these things. He's continuing to try to like move on and make things better. And they're also kind of all coming together because, as you mentioned, he has this production studio, Maximum Effort, and that is one of the ways in which he is able to make these ads. And what he did with Wrexham was he made a documentary series, which was pretty well received. And if he does the same thing with the Ottawa Senators, he'll also make a series about that process. So Mm. he's really kind of merging all of these things together. Some vertical integration. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think what we can say for sure is that the banking industry just needs to hire Ryan Reynolds and everything will be okay. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really not sure what else we need. You know, I did see (laughs) that he had recently invested in a Canadian fintech company and I was kind of curious to see, is he going to Ryan Reynolds that or is that just kind of like, because other celebrities had also invested in it. So maybe that one's quieter, but we'll see it. 
Yeah, well, that will be the ultimate test and that will also do it for us today. Thanks for tuning in to the Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Hartwig and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, go get yourself signed up at thehustle.co slash email. Catch you all next week. Hey, I want to tell you about another podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. This one is called My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Puri. My First Million features famous guests like Alex Hermosi, Sophia Amoruso, and Hassan Minaj sharing their secrets for how they made their first million and how to apply their learnings to capitalize on today's business trends and opportunities. So for example, in a recent episode, Sean discusses how his former intern went from making $30,000 a year to $40,000 in one minute by taking one big bet. And today, he's a 22-year-old millionaire thanks to a couple early investments. Want to know more? You can listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts.